Number 10. Scorned Gold Digger Gets Cruel Revenge A Sydney man named Faisal Khan was looking for a loyal companion who shares his faith when he went on a Muslim dating site in 2017. He connected with a woman in Morocco named Asme and was so smitten he flew to her country to meet her and her family. During his trip to Morocco, he proposed to Asme, and to his delight, she said yes. The couple wasn't married for long before Faisal began to suspect Asme of using him for an Australian visa. He later told reporters with a current affair that he worked two jobs to support her extravagant lifestyle, which included designer clothing and shoes, vacations, fine dining, and other luxury items and experiences. Faisal also paid for travel back and forth to Morocco. He financed the couple's wedding and he even sent money to Asme's family. But despite Faisal's generosity and hard work, he couldn't keep up with his new wife's demands, and the marriage quickly began to deteriorate as newly wedded bliss gave way to nightly arguments. After becoming convinced that he was being used, Faisal consulted a lawyer, but somehow, Asme found out. Upon arriving home one evening, he entered his apartment to find it completely trashed, with Asme standing amid the mess. It looked like it had been completely ransacked. Furniture was overturned, glass was shattered, wine was spilled on the carpet, and belongings were haphazardly strewn across the floor. Asme allegedly made a statement to the effect of, You think you're so smart talking with lawyers, now see what I do to you. Then afterwards she rushed out of the apartment. A few hours later, police arrested Faisal on suspicion of assault. He was accused of giving his wife a black eye, but he insisted that he didn't lay a finger on her. And to make matters even worse, he claimed that Asme stole some of his belongings from the apartment while he spent the night in jail. In addition to dishing out tens of thousands of dollars for a lawyer, he poured copious amounts of time and energy into looking for evidence that would prove his innocence. Remembering that Asme appeared perfectly fine before running out of the apartment, he knew that the injuries she blamed him for must have happened at some point between then and when she showed up at the police station. Security footage from the elevator at the couple's apartment building allegedly showed Asme rushing into the lift, waiting until the door closed, and then punching herself in the face twice. It was enough to convince the authorities to drop Faisal's criminal case, but they seemed like they were in no hurry to charge Asme with making a false allegation. The sham marriage left Faisal broke, in debt, and living with roommates. Meanwhile, Asme allegedly went into hiding. While the outcome of the incident is unclear, Faisal felt strongly enough about the situation to go on national TV and call for Asme to be arrested and deported. Number 9. Nikki Yavino in 2016, a young woman named Nikki Yavino accused two college football players of brutally attacking her at a campus party in Fairfield, Connecticut. And while the law considers suspects innocent until proven guilty, the allegations immediately began destroying the men's lives in other ways. They were both kicked off of their football team and they lost their college scholarships. And what was even worse was that everyone knew who they were because they had their names plastered in the news. Yavino reportedly told investigators that the suspects pulled her into a room and held her down while they took turns assaulting her. She claimed that she told the men she didn't want to do anything with them and that she begged them to let her leave. But witnesses told a different story, with some claiming that Yavino looked perfectly willing to go behind closed doors with the men. Police then brought her in for further questioning, and she recanted her original story. She also allegedly admitted that she made the whole thing up in a bid to gain sympathy from a man she was interested in dating. In the end, Yavino pleaded guilty to two counts of second degree falsely reporting an incident and one count of interfering with police. She served one year in prison, followed by two years of probation, and the court denied her attempt to get off probation early. Number 8. Brianna Harmon Talbot In early 2017, a seemingly distraught young woman rushed into a church in Denison, Texas and claimed that she'd just been attacked by three men. She was bleeding and only partially dressed, and Good Samaritans were quick to step in and call the authorities for her. Police identified the woman as 18-year-old Brianna Harmon Talbot, and just hours earlier, her then fiancé had reported her as a missing person after finding her car abandoned and her belongings scattered on the ground outside their home. Talbot described her alleged attackers as a trio of black men wearing masks. She claimed that they approached her in a parking lot and then forced her into an SUV. They drove her into the woods 
and that's where she claimed that they proceeded to hold her down and assault her. When asked about her injuries, Talbot said that one of the men had a knife and that he cut her while she fought him off. Police were quick to notice discrepancies in the young woman's story, and as the investigation continued, they grew increasingly suspicious that Talbot wasn't telling the truth about what had happened. Beyond the discrepancies in her story, medical professionals also observed that Talbot's injuries were inconsistent with her claims, and the tears in her clothing failed to align with the actual locations of her injuries. Two weeks after making the initial report, Talbot admitted that she'd made the story up. She explained that she and her fiancé had fought earlier that day, and she went into a nearby abandoned house to self-harm. Worried that her family would be angry at her for how she chose to cope with her emotions, Talbot decided to lie and make a spectacle of herself. Instead of going to trial, she pleaded guilty to four felony counts of tampering with or fabricating physical evidence and tampering with government documents. Talbot received a deferred adjudication sentence, which meant that if she follows the rules of her probation for eight years, she'll avoid having a felony conviction on her record. She was also ordered to repay the costs of the police investigation and perform community service. Number 7. Marcus Gilliam During what began as an ordinary shift at a Shake Shack in Manhattan in June of 2020, location manager Marcus Gilliam prepared three milkshakes that were ordered ahead of time using the restaurant's mobile app. Three NYPD officers then came in for the shakes, but they said that the drinks tasted strange. Gilliam apologized and immediately offered to prepare something else on the menu. He also offered the trio some cards for free food on their next visit, something he said he often gave to members of law enforcement even when they didn't complain, just to show his appreciation for the work that they do. Gilliam later told the New York Daily News that the cops politely thanked him for the cards and then left the restaurant. A short while later, around 25 police officers allegedly entered the restaurant and ordered staff members to sit on the floor. According to Gilliam, the cops taunted and mocked the employees, causing one worker to burst into tears and another to quit. Then one of the officers accused Gilliam of poisoning the three cops, who'd complained about their milkshakes tasting funny. He was taken down to a nearby precinct, where he was questioned extensively and accused of tainting the milkshakes with bleach. The allegations came shortly after George Floyd's death at the hands of Officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis. Racial tensions reached a disturbing high as protesters and police officers clashed in cities throughout America, including the Big Apple. And the officers who accused Gilliam of poisoning them were on protest duty at the time of the incident. Gilliam and the Shake Shack were cleared of any legal wrongdoing the next day. But Gilliam and his co-workers were relentlessly harassed by people who were convinced of their guilt. He told the Daily News that he received over a hundred voicemails accusing him of trying to kill cops. And when he crossed paths with one of his accusers the following week, he was overwhelmed by panic and anxiety, even though the officer didn't seem to recognize him. The mentally scarred manager went on to quit his job and took a new gig working in construction and he filed a federal defamation lawsuit against the city and police. Number 6. Santana Renee Adams Police in Barbersville, West Virginia, received an alarming 911 call in April 2019 from a young mother who claimed that a strange man had tried to snatch her child at a shopping mall. 24-year-old Santana Renee Adams reportedly told law enforcement that she reacted by pulling her gun on the man. Responding officers then spotted 54-year-old Mohammed Fathi Hussein Zayan and promptly arrested him. Social media users praised Adams for her quick-thinking response to the alleged abduction attempt, which many credited with saving her daughter's life. But investigators quickly began to poke holes in her version of events, as they were suspiciously unable to find any witnesses to back up Adams' story. Adams initially told officers that a man of Middle Eastern descent had tried to drag her child away by her hair, at which point she drew her 9mm Smith & Wesson handgun. She also claimed that Zion rushed out of the store and that he began walking toward her when they crossed paths a little while later. But surveillance footage showed no evidence of Adams and Zion interacting at all. The closest the two came to one another was when Adams exited the mall about 30 seconds before Zion, who went in a separate direction and made no contact with the young woman. In fact, he didn't even look in Adams' direction. And he also never approached or interacted with the woman's child. 
According to a since-deleted Facebook post by the Barbersville Police Department, Adams eventually admitted that the incident may not have been a kidnapping attempt. She reportedly acknowledged that Zion may have harmlessly patted her daughter on the head and smiled, and the confusion was blamed on a cultural misunderstanding. But to make matters even more confusing, she'd later go back to her original story in court. Authorities dropped the case against Zion and released him from jail. At the time, the Egyptian national was in the United States for an engineering job, and he was innocently shopping for clothes for his own family at Old Navy when the bizarre encounter occurred. Adam's motives for allegedly making the false claims and whether she meant any harm were unclear. Police blamed social media, which has become a popular platform for stories about attempted abductions in recent years. And according to officials, these heart-stopping stories tend to go viral even when there's little to no evidence to back them up. In the end, Adams was charged with one misdemeanor count of falsely reporting an emergency. She was eventually acquitted, but the case undoubtedly brought the kind of attention that can severely disrupt someone's life and negatively impact their reputation. Number 5. Ronald Bell and Jennifer Pendley a basketball coach at the Georgia Institute of Technology fell victim to a diabolical plot in 2017 when 56-year-old Ronald Bell and his girlfriend at the time, 50-year-old Jennifer Pendley, tried to extort the school by falsely accusing him of assault. According to federal authorities, Bell and Pendley persuaded a security guard to claim that he saw coach Josh Pastner attacking Pendley. Bell claimed that the scheme would yield a $20 million payout and the security guard initially agreed to play along on the promise of a large chunk of cash and a new Jeep. Then, in an attempt to cash in on a quick payday, Bell and Pendley demanded $20 million in exchange for retracting the assault allegation and not going to the police. But when the university refused to pay, Pendley filed a lawsuit against Pastner, demanding compensation for battery, assault, and emotional distress. According to ESPN, Bell and Pastner were former friends. But after being harassed over the bogus assault case for several months, Pastner sued Bell and Pendley for defamation. And a little while later, an independent investigation cleared him of any wrongdoing. The FBI got involved, and the security guard eventually admitted to making false statements. All three suspects were arrested, and Bell ultimately pleaded guilty to a federal conspiracy charge. He was sentenced to 33 months in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. Pendley also pleaded guilty to conspiracy, but she has yet to receive her sentence. Number 4. Eleanor Williams During a night out drinking with friends in Barrow, England in 2019, 18-year-old Jordan Trengove noticed that a member of his group, Eleanor Williams, had disappeared. But he figured she went off to do her own thing elsewhere and focused his attention on the conversation he was having with an attractive young woman named Ebony. Toward the end of the night, Trengove allegedly became belligerent toward a taxi driver. He and Ebony were then picked up by a police van and dropped off at a friend's house where they hooked up and then carried on with their lives the next day. But several weeks later, the police busted into Trengove's home and arrested him on allegations of drugging and assaulting Eleanor Williams that same night. Eager to prove his innocence and put the case behind him as quickly as possible, he cooperated fully with investigators. Trengo voluntarily handed his phone over to be searched, allowed police to examine his body for any signs of injury that might suggest he'd attacked someone, and did everything else that was asked of him. However, his claims of innocence fell on deaf ears. Police charged Trengove in connection with the alleged assault, and he was thrown in jail while awaiting trial. In the meantime, he became the victim of widespread hatred due to the horrifying nature of the allegations he faced. When Williams filed the complaint, she provided police with incriminating Snapchat messages that appeared to be from Trengove, but they'd later realized that the account was created using Williams' Wi-Fi, giving them their first inkling that the young woman may be trying to frame the defendant. Her story continued to fall apart from there, and Trengove was released from jail after spending 10 weeks behind bars. Ebony helped clear Trengove's name by sharing her account of the night in question, along with photos she took of herself and Trengove during the alleged time of the attack. But in this case, the court of public opinion was less forgiving than the legal system. After being freed, Trengove felt like he couldn't escape his tarnished reputation. 
and his mental health hit rock bottom as he became overwhelmed with feelings of hopelessness and despair. Even though Trengove had been cleared of any wrongdoing, community members continued to rally around Williams. They seemed convinced that Trengove had gotten away with a horrific crime and that Williams was being denied due justice. Then, in May of 2020, Williams claimed that she'd been abducted and trafficked by a gang of Asian men after falling victim to their grooming techniques. And in response, police charged local business owner Mohamed Ramzan with human trafficking. Just like Trengove, he insisted he was innocent, but faced severe hatred from the public, who were still convinced that Williams was a victim. But the truth was, she was lying, and her false allegations eventually caught up with her and led to her arrest. Meanwhile, Ramzan was released from jail, and the case against him was dropped. By then, though, he'd lost his business and was routinely receiving death threats from Williams' supporters. According to authorities, Williams victimized numerous people with false allegations of kidnapping, assault, and other crimes. She was a serial liar who accused everyone from her classmates to total strangers of committing unspeakable acts of violence against her. Nobody knows why Williams deliberately ruined lives with her lies, but a jury harbored no doubts of her guilt. In the end, she was convicted of eight counts of perverting the course of justice and received an eight and a half year prison sentence. Number three, Jennifer Grease. During the summer of 2022, while employed by Stanford University's housing department, 25-year-old Jennifer Grease allegedly visited a San Jose, California hospital and asserted that she'd suffered an assault within a campus restroom. She depicted her assailant as a tall African-American man in his late 20s. She also said he had a slight build and that he sported a faded beard. Healthcare personnel were then informed by Grease that she had reservations about involving the police due to the assailant being an unknown perpetrator. But regardless of her alleged reservations, a hospital staff member notified the college authorities, prompting a campus-wide safety alert. According to law enforcement, Grease engaged with the school's public safety department to inquire about the legal procedure, yet refrained from divulging additional details of the incident. The Santa Clara County District Attorney subsequently stated that Grease claimed familiarity with her attacker and assured a detective that he posed no threat to the public. She hadn't anticipated that a community alert would be sent out regarding the incident and inquired whether her report would be communicated to human resources. Within a span of less than two months, Grease once again purportedly visited Stanford Hospital, alleging another sexual assault by a black man in his late 20s. But this time, the incident occurred within a storage closet. Court documents indicate that Grease signed consent forms during both hospital visits, acknowledging the staff's duty as mandated reporters. This implied their obligation to relay information about suspicious injury reports, along with her identity, to law enforcement, an obligation that was fulfilled. During the examination of Grease, hospital staff reportedly found no trace of male DNA. This discrepancy between her account and the absence of tangible evidence led detectives to suspect that the entire narrative had been fabricated. The district attorney's office contended that Grease concocted these accounts out of anger, directed towards a co-worker who bore a resemblance to the description she provided for her fictitious attacker. Notably, Grease had previously lodged a harassment complaint against this co-worker, although an internal inquiry concluded that the complaint lacked substantiating evidence. Grease allegedly informed a friend of a romantic relationship with the man and even claimed to be carrying his child. However, these allegations were proven false. Then, in early 2023, she admitted to falsifying her complaints and issued an apologetic letter to the man implicated in her accusations. The accused co-worker vehemently denied any romantic or intimate involvement with Grease. He fully cooperated throughout the investigation, providing an alibi for the periods during which the alleged assaults occurred and voluntarily submitting a DNA sample. But no basis existed to suspect him of any wrongdoing, leading to his exoneration. However, the tremendous strain of facing such grave and baseless allegations, compounded by law enforcement scrutiny, left him psychologically scarred. 
And in a statement to the district attorney's office, he conveyed feeling disgusted and dehumanized. Jennifer Grease faces two felony counts of perjury and two misdemeanor counts of inducing false testimony, and she remains under supervised release pending her forthcoming court appearance. Number two, the satanic panic. Starting in the early 1980s, a collective panic over ritualistic abuse plagued the United States, and by the time the so-called Satanic Panic ended in the mid-90s, more than 12,000 unsubstantiated cases of abuse had been brought forth throughout the country. The panic coincided with the rising popularity of an unreliable treatment method called recovered memory therapy, which sometimes triggered patients to remember things that never happened. In some cases, young people told false stories under pressure from adults or authorities who didn't believe them when they said that nobody had harmed them. In the vast majority of cases, there was no actual evidence of any wrongdoing on behalf of the accused, but the satanic panic held a tight grip on the US, and even the government bought into the hysteria. Many suspects were falsely convicted and sent to prison based solely on shaky eyewitness testimony and misconstrued evidence. Meanwhile, Congress doubled its funding for protecting vulnerable people from crime. It wouldn't have been a bad thing if the money hadn't been used in a misguided fight against a type of crime that, in reality, is relatively rare. The satanic panic was further fueled by so-called experts who were often featured on the news, used as expert witnesses in court cases and entrusted with advising families and law enforcement. Many of these individuals were later debunked, including American comedian and evangelist Mike Warnk. Warnk claimed to have first-hand experiences with Satanism, but was ultimately found out to be little more than a grandiose storyteller. Theologian and philosopher Karl Raschke was another prominent voice of the period, and when people criticized his work for lacking factual support, he was quick to accuse them of being cult apologists. He even believed that the popular role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons was an initiation into black magic. In many parts of the US, people who were falsely convicted during the Satanic Panic are still being exonerated and released from prison after spending decades behind bars for imaginary crimes. And one of the most well-known cases from the period came in 1994, when a group of lesbian friends known as the San Antonio Four landed at the center of false abuse claims. At a time when open discrimination against gay Americans was rampant, especially in the South, the women found a safe haven at the home of Elizabeth Ramirez. A relative of Ramirez accused the friends of satanic abuse months after spending the day with the group, landing her a 37 and a half year prison sentence. And as a result, Christy Mayhew, Cassandra River, and Anna Vasquez each received 15 year sentences. More than 10 years later, the Texas Innocence Project took on the women's cases. The alleged victim recanted key testimony, now claiming that their father had forced them to lie because he was angry at Ramirez for rejecting his advances. An expert witness also recanted her testimony after realizing that she'd falsely determined that a victim's scar was caused by abuse-related injuries. The San Antonio Four were released from prison in 2012 and 2013. They then spent the next several years fighting to get their convictions vacated and their records expunged as the false allegations continued to follow them around. Speaking with local station KSAT in 2022, Ramirez expressed her fears that satanic panic is on the rise again in the form of far-right conspiracy theories that are attracting large followings. After fighting for decades to fully get her life back, she hopes her experience serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of irrational hysteria and how easily lives are destroyed when the lines between reality and imagination become blurred. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Ian and Angela Diaz. Divorces are seldom enjoyable experiences, but Ian Diaz and Michelle Hadley encountered relatively minimal conflicts when they parted ways in 2015. Their primary disagreement centered on the ownership of a condominium in Anaheim, California. Michelle had initially supplied the down payment and was listed on the mortgage, which mandated her responsibility for the payments, despite her no longer residing there. But the situation remained unresolved as Ian welcomed his new partner, Angela Connell, 
and invited her to live in the condo. In February 2016, Ian and Angela got married, and only three months later, the newlyweds began spreading serious allegations against Michelle, claiming she'd engaged in severe online harassment of Angela. They also claimed that Michelle orchestrated instances of luring predatory men to Angela's residence using fabricated Craigslist advertisements. During a visit to the police station, Ian, asserting his role as a U.S. deputy marshal who dealt with criminal investigations professionally, depicted his ex-wife's behavior as unparalleled in its extremity. Both he and Angela depicted Michelle as a perilous stalker, with Ian even stating on one occasion that she warranted restraint and confinement. But in reality, Michelle remained wholly oblivious to the accusations leveled against her by the police. She neither harassed Angela nor took any actions to endanger Ian's new wife. Her sole desire was to settle the condominium dispute and proceed with her life. Her intentions toward Ian and Angela were without malice, a fact she shared with the authorities. Nevertheless, she found herself regarded as deceitful, and this led to her arrest. A judge issued a restraining order prohibiting Michelle from contacting or approaching Angela, but in a matter of days, Michelle was accused of violating this order. The charges against her included stalking, kidnapping, and other grave felonies, prompting her incarceration. Due to the high-profile nature of the case and the nature of the allegations, Michelle experienced harassment and threats while in jail. Adding to her plight, she faced the grim possibility of life imprisonment if found guilty. Assisted by her family and legal counsel, Michelle tirelessly advocated for her innocence while behind bars, and a subsequent investigation traced the harassing messages back to Ian and Angela, ultimately vindicating Michelle's claims. The couple had orchestrated the messages using fake social media accounts, then wrongfully implicated Michelle. Then finally, after enduring three months of county lockup, Michelle was released and all charges against her were dismissed. Angela, on the other hand, faced a litany of charges, 10 felonies and nearly two dozen misdemeanors, including cyberstalking, conspiracy, perjury, and false imprisonment. And in the end, she ultimately admitted guilt and received a five-year prison sentence. Although Ian professed ignorance of his wife's involvement in the deceptive scheme, investigators had long suspected his complicity. It was believed that he sought retribution against Michelle for ending their relationship and aimed to secure her imprisonment to retain control of the condo. Then in 2021, Ian faced federal charges of cyberstalking, conspiracy, perjury and obstruction, resulting in a 2023 conviction and a 10-year prison sentence. Michelle Hadley pursued a civil lawsuit against the city of Anaheim and four of its police officers, leading to a confidential settlement. The ordeal left her emotionally scarred with enduring repercussions, but she managed to rebuild her life and reportedly thrives today. Number 14. Savannah Henderson In the United States, prostitution is only legal in a small handful of counties in Nevada. Located within this region is the world-famous Moonlight Bunny Ranch, which has been open for business for decades since 1955. For the most part, it's a safe place for members of the world's oldest profession to carry out their work in peace. But no business is immune to crime, and in early 2023, a fight between two employees led to shots being fired. While responding to the property right outside Carson City, police heard heavy gunfire. They quickly evacuated the building as the employee accused of firing the gunshots retreated to her room and refused to come outside. A three-hour standoff between crisis negotiators and the suspect, 28-year-old Savannah Henderson, kicked off. Eventually, the woman surrendered. Luckily, nobody was injured in the attack. Henderson was initially charged with four counts of being a felon in possession of a weapon, one count each of drug possession, discharging a weapon, and obstructing resisting a peace officer. She paid $86,000 in bail money and quickly went onto social media after her release from jail. In a series of tweets, Henderson insisted police got the wrong person and said her booking numbers were skyrocketing since the incident. Eight days after the shooting, she announced that her charges had been dropped altogether. Number 13. Jesus Asensio Molina 
During an interview with an Oregon-based news station called KATU in 2018, Ruben Lopez remembered hearing a heated argument from down the street while doing some work on a house in Happy Valley, Oregon. A few minutes later, a medical helicopter came and picked a person up at the property. It turned out a construction worker at an unfinished house nearby had actually attacked his co-worker, Andres Marcelo, with a nail gun, resulting in life-threatening injuries. The victim's brother-in-law, who saw the incident, told KATU that the attack happened without any warning at all. He accused the suspect, 24-year-old Jesus Asensio Molina, of repeatedly firing nails into the victim for no reason. Some of the nails struck him right in the head, but he was reportedly still conscious when taken to the hospital. Luckily, he survived the ordeal. Molina fled the scene and was arrested the next morning during a police manhunt. He was charged with attempted murder, but the case fell off the news radar shortly after it first broke, and the outcome is now unclear. According to authorities, Molina had been deported from the United States six years before. Immigration and Customs Enforcement issued a request for Oregon authorities to notify them before letting him go. Records show that he's no longer in local custody, but Clackamas County's policy of non-cooperation most likely means that ICE was never properly informed. Number 12. Viral McDonald's Brawl In a TikTok that went viral back in November 2022, two McDonald's employees were seen facing off with one another while holding restaurant equipment in their hands. The clip showed a female worker grabbing one of the metal baskets used for deep-frying food, while another picked up a heavy metal trash can. They stood facing each other and yelling profanities while a third employee, who was filming, stood by and watched. The footage was posted by a user named Renee under the handle at forever.christy. In a follow-up video not long after that night, she said that her cousin, who apparently worked at the restaurant, became frustrated after having to repeatedly fix orders that were being put into the computer system incorrectly. After her anger reached a boiling point, Renee's cousin asked the employee at the register what their problem was. The counter worker responded aggressively, and the fight almost became physical. Thankfully, it didn't, and no one was hurt. Number 11. Craig Armstead In 2006, Kerry Harris moved from Memphis to Atlanta to start a new, promising job as a quality assurance manager at the Cargill Food Company. As one of the largest privately held corporations in the entire U.S., the company offered her a competitive salary and the potential for future growth, so Kerry looked forward to the many opportunities that came with the job. She quickly became well-known among her co-workers as polite and professional, keeping her personal and work lives entirely separate from one another and staying far away from workplace drama. And while most people respected Kerry's desire for privacy, an employee named Craig Armstead seemed overly eager to connect with her. During her first days on the job, he gave her a welcome cake. At first, Kerry wrote Armstead's gesture off as strange but kind. She thanked him for the cake and thought nothing else of it. Kerry soon started to notice that someone was going into her office and moving things around when she wasn't inside. She didn't know who exactly was doing it, but even stranger things began happening over time. One time, she had unexplainable car trouble in the parking lot at work. Of course, Armstead magically showed up and knew exactly how to get the car to start. Sometimes, Kerry felt like she was being followed on her drive home. One night, it became clear that someone was actually trailing her. She couldn't tell who it was, so she became terrified. The car finally stopped pursuing her when she pulled into the parking lot of a police station. Over the next few months, Armstead continued to give Kerry flowers and inappropriate gifts, which she politely refused. She told Armstead she didn't date her co-workers, but he kept up the act. Kerry eventually had to report the man to management. Armstead received a written warning and was told not to speak with her unless it was work-related. After doing a little bit of digging, Kerry's friend found out that Armstead had served five years in prison back in the 90s for killing his girlfriend. The discovery deeply worried Kerry, but she continued going to work and focusing on her job, hoping Armstead would just leave her alone. 
Two years after starting with Cargill, she received a promotion, and perhaps not surprisingly, Armstead congratulated her with an expensive digital organizer. Kerry once again turned down his gift. Not long after that, she and a co-worker found a hidden camera in the woman's bathroom. She took the camera to Human Resources, who later determined that it belonged to Armstead and that it had over a thousand hours of perverted footage on it. Since it was still recording when Carrie turned it in, Armstead knew she was the one who found it. A few hours later, he brutally stabbed Carrie to death in her office and left the scene. He was quickly arrested. Just like his previous case for killing his girlfriend, Armstead tried to plead insanity, claiming that an evil voice in his head told him to kill Carrie. But the court didn't buy it at all, and he was convicted of murder, aggravated assault, and a weapon charge, along with 18 counts of unlawful eavesdropping and surveillance for the videos on the hidden camera. Armstead was sentenced to life plus 60 years for what he did. Number 10. Amy Bishop on what seemed like a normal day in 2010, police responded to a call in Huntsville about a shooting at the University of Alabama. Officers arrived and found a horrifying scene in a meeting room where three staff members were dead from gunshot wounds. They were discovered along with several other employees, including two who were seriously injured. According to witnesses, a biology professor named Amy Bishop stood up and started shooting at her colleagues during a meeting. She acted normal for the first 30 to 40 minutes of the gathering before suddenly pulling out a Ruger handgun and opening fire out of nowhere. To those who live to tell their story of what happened, it was clear that this was no random act of violence. Bishop pointed and fired at her co-workers in a deliberate manner, carrying out what seemed to be a planned workplace massacre. Thankfully, her gun jammed before she could kill everyone in sight. As Bishop struggled with the firearm, survivors rushed to push her out of the room and block her from coming back in. Police took her into custody within a few minutes after getting to the scene. Bishop's victims were all extremely well-liked members of the academic community. People nobody could ever imagine someone wanting dead. The shooting happened after Bishop failed to reach tenure status at the university, where she had hoped to land a permanent position. She appealed the decision multiple times and was denied time and time again. Shortly before the shooting, she had lost another appeal. The victims had all actually supported Bishop's bid for tenure, but she apparently hated all her colleagues equally at that point and resented their tenure statuses. She had an alarming history of violent outbursts pointing toward many deadly anger issues. In 1986, she fatally shot her brother during a fight, but avoided charges after the family convinced police it was all a huge accident. In 1994, Bishop and her husband were suspected of mailing pipe bombs to her former lab supervisor at Harvard, where she earned her PhD. This was supposedly revenge, for giving her a bad review. Eight years later, she was arrested for assaulting a woman at a restaurant where the victim had taken the last available booster seat for her kid. Bishop demanded that the woman hand over the seat, which she wanted to use for one of her four children. When the victim refused, Bishop slugged her right in the face. Her past showed a clear pattern of arrogance, aggression, and terrible reactions when she didn't get her way. She initially tried pleading insanity, but ultimately pleaded guilty and was ordered to serve life in prison without parole opportunities. Number 9. Robert Peterson After going through a bitter divorce in the early 2000s, Jean Thurnor moved all the way from Nebraska to Land Lakes, Florida, where he took a job as an air traffic controller at the St. Pete Clearwater Airport. A few years later, he married one of his co-workers, Juanita, and the couple decided to build a brand new house. Their future looked bright, but an unexpected tragedy struck them in 2006. Shortly after moving into their new home, the couple's co-worker, Robert Peterson, said he was going to stop by with a housewarming gift. He gave the couple a photo album filled with pictures detailing a week-by-week -week progression of the construction of their house. It was a thoughtful but strange gift, considering Jean and Juanita were unaware Peterson had ever even been to their house. During the visit, Juanita had to leave and run a few errands. When she came home, she found a trail of blood leading to a pile of her husband's bloody clothes. 
Jean was soon discovered murdered and mutilated at Peterson's home, where Peterson was also found dead. Based on the evidence they found, police concluded that Peterson had shot Jean before deciding to take his own life. An investigation followed, revealing disturbing evidence of a long-standing obsession that eventually drove Peterson to kill. Peterson and Jean met while working together as air traffic controllers in Nebraska. During that time, Peterson showed a somewhat odd interest in befriending Jean and had even asked if he could buy one of Jean's dogs after seeing a photo of them. After transferring to Florida, Jean received a photo of his old apartment in the mail from Peterson, along with a handwritten message basically saying, do you see what you left behind? Jean interpreted the letter as a snarky complaint about leaving the Nebraska location understaffed and didn't think much else of it. Three months after Jean moved to Florida, Peterson transferred to the same airport. Jean initially wrote his co-worker off as eccentric. He also assumed Peterson had his own reasons for moving to the state and chalked it up to a big coincidence. When Jean and Juanita started dating, they kept their relationship on the low at their job. Peterson discovered the relationship, and the only way he could have realized the two were a couple was by following them or seeing them out together by coincidence. The latter was unlikely. After the couple married and made plans to move into their newly built home, Peterson offered to buy Jean's old house. Despite the disturbingly clingy behavior, the Thurnors were still friendly toward Peterson, writing him off as an odd loner with annoying but harmless tendencies. As it turned out, Peterson had been secretly spying on the Thurnors more than they realized. In fact, he was straight up stalking them, driven by an obsession that bordered a romantic fantasy. His feelings were detailed in a three-page handwritten note that Juanita found after the murder. In the letter, Peterson said he had been in love with Jean for many years. He also wrote that he was not going to leave Jean's house until certain intimate acts had happened. Based on the letter alone, it's safe to assume that Jean resisted Peterson's unwanted advances, causing his creepy co-worker to finally snap. Sadly, instead of recognizing his need for mental help, Peterson took extreme measures, forcing Jean to pay with his life and leaving behind a trail of devastation for his loved ones. Number 8. Daniel Edwards Known for her gentle and sweet personality, a 60-year-old horse trainer and farmhand named Fiona Southwell was liked by basically everyone she met. Yet in 2017, someone hated her enough to stab her to death in an uncontrolled fit of rage. Fiona's lifeless body was discovered in a barn at her workplace in northern England, where her killer had violently ambushed her. She had at least 19 stab wounds and multiple defensive wounds, which showed that she fought desperately for her life during her last few moments. The people in Fiona's life found it unimaginable that someone could have wanted her dead, but she unknowingly made an enemy several months earlier when she was hired at her job to replace a troubled farmhand named Daniel Edwards. The farm owners fired Edwards for having a poor attendance record, but he ultimately blamed Fiona for being terminated. He made several creepy posts on social media leading up to the attack, including one stating that he was going to let his demons out to play soon. It was clear based on Edward's Facebook posts alone that he saw himself as a victim and wanted revenge. One of the saddest aspects of Fiona's murder is that she was planning on leaving the job soon and moving to southern England to start a new chapter in life. Sadly, she never even got the chance. Edward suffered from multiple intellectual setbacks that limited his career prospects. He also allegedly had substance abuse problems and lacked a stable home environment. But personal struggles are no excuse for killing someone, and after finding evidence connecting him to the crime, police charged him accordingly. A jury later convicted Edwards of murder, which comes with an automatic life sentence in Britain. But judges were allowed to impose a minimum sentence, which means that many convicts see freedom again. Edwards' lawyer practically begged the judge to consider Edwards' developmental issues in deciding his sentence, noting that his client had the mental capabilities of a nine-year-old. After weighing it against the gruesome and unprovoked nature of the crime, the judge sentenced Edwards to a 24-year minimum. Number 7. Michael Stark 50-year-old Matthew Branning mysteriously vanished in 2021 after he failed to come home from his shift at a manufacturing company in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
He was never located, but authorities believe he was killed by his co-worker, Michael Stark. The man was charged with the crime in 2023. According to the district attorney's office, Stark failed to show up to work on the day of Branning's disappearance. Toward the end of the victim's shift, he allegedly called an Uber and got dropped off at the job site where he waited for the victim to leave. He then kidnapped Branning and forced him to take him to a drive through ATM, where surveillance footage captured Branning withdrawing large amounts of money. In the video, nobody seemed to be in the front passenger seat, but prosecutors claim that a person was partially visible in the back seat. Law enforcement tracked Branning's SUV to parts of central and southern New Jersey. At the same time the vehicle was at a gas station in Cape May, Stark was seen on the store's security cameras. Branning was nowhere to be seen. At some point during these travels, investigators believe Stark killed Branning and got rid of his body. The SUV was eventually found in Virginia. Inside, police saw several drug vials that they do not think belonged to Branning, who was a well-known family man who lived a healthy and law-abiding lifestyle. They believe he was targeted by Stark since he was known to carry large amounts of cash. It's rare for prosecutors to pursue a case without a body, but after two years of searching while other evidence stacked up, they believe they had a strong enough case to secure a conviction. Stark is currently being held without bail on murder and kidnapping charges while he awaits the next steps in his case. Number 6. Antoinette Martinez and Camio Kleins one morning back in 2014, a rancher spotted the murdered body of a young man on his property in Becker County, Texas. The victim had been shot multiple times and tied up with tape. Based on the evidence found at the scene, police theorized that the victim was abducted and driven to the property. He was shot in the back and passed away face down, indicating that he made a last-ditch effort to escape his killer. Investigators found no cell phone, wallet, or ID near his remains, pointing toward robbery as the most likely motive for the crime. The victim was later identified as 20-year-old Xavier Cordero, who had recently been reported missing by a few of his co-workers. By all accounts, he was an ordinary young man who typically stayed out of trouble. His girlfriend told police that Xavier had left in his car to meet someone late at night and simply never came home. The last known person Xavier had phone contact with, his ex-girlfriend Antoinette Martinez, claimed that he was supposed to come see her on the night of the murder, but never actually showed up. Meanwhile, another young man, Stephen Rendon, went missing and was discovered bound and murdered under suspiciously similar circumstances. Everything started coming together when an aggravated robbery suspect named Cameo Kleins was seen running to Antoinette's apartment. After arresting Cameo, police searched the home and found both Xavier and Stephen's IDs, along with the gun that killed both victims. Realizing the gig was up, Antoinette decided to come clean to law enforcement. Antoinette and Cameo were co-workers at a restaurant who bonded over a shared resentment of their boss, their low wages, and lack of overtime pay. Instead of asking for a raise, they decided to take the money they believed was owed to them. In the first of what turned out to be multiple robberies, Cameo held up the restaurant while Antoinette was still working. She posed as a victim, and they shared in the proceeds afterwards. Not long after that, Antoinette lured Xavier Cordero over to her apartment. He came over and started to undress, thinking they were about to mess around, when Cameo suddenly entered the room and ordered him to hand over his money and valuables. Xavier refused to cooperate. What was meant to be a robbery soon escalated to kidnapping and murder. After realizing that Xavier didn't have as much money on him as they thought he would, Antoinette and Cameo decided to strike again. This time, Antoinette posted a couple of photos online, along with an invitation for men who were looking for a fun time. Stephen Rendon took the bait and became their next victim. Once in custody, the co-workers each claimed they were under the other's spell when they carried out the murders, but footage of the two suspects talking at the police station, unaware that they were being filmed, showed that they both had an equal hand in the crimes. Even more disturbing was the fact that they could be seen laughing and joking about what they'd done. Cameo took a plea deal and admitted to murder in exchange for two life sentences, and the possibility of parole. Antoinette took her chances on a trial and was found guilty of capital murder. She's now serving life without parole. Number 5. Connor Sturgeon 
One morning in 2023, the day was just starting out for employees at an old National Bank location in Louisville, Kentucky, when one of their co-workers opened fire without warning. Using an AR-15 he had bought just days earlier, 25-year-old Connor Sturgeon killed five people and injured eight others, including a responding police officer who survived after being shot directly in the head. Sturgeon was fatally wounded while exchanging gunfire with law enforcement. After finding his phone in his pocket, police realized he had actually live-streamed the shooting on social media. Although he had a long history of depression, many of those who knew Sturgeon were completely shocked by his actions. Described by a former bank manager as low-key and relaxed, his personality didn't match the image of a mass shooter. But the signs were there, and unfortunately in some cases, they were overlooked. A search of his phone and apartment building revealed that Sturgeon had confided in a friend leading up to the crime, stating that he felt suicidal and wanted to kill people. In his last social media post, he wrote, they won't listen to words or protests. Let's see if they hear this. Police discovered notes on Sturgeon's body stating that one of his goals was to prove how easy it is for a mentally ill person to get a gun in the United States. Law enforcement also reportedly found messages on his phone outlining his plans to commit the massacre. The investigation is still ongoing. So far, authorities have released very limited details about their findings. And while some information about what was going on in Sturgeon's mind has been revealed, the full reasoning behind the slaughter is unclear. Number 4. Christopher Gregory and Jennifer Walter 18-year-old Christy Robbins got pregnant straight out of high school in 1998. About a year after giving birth, Christy broke up with her baby daddy Christopher Gregory, got custody of their son, and moved back into her parents' house in Beaumont, Texas. She tried to stay civil for their child's sake, even when Christopher fell behind on child support payments and challenged their custody arrangement in family court. Christopher soon started dating Jennifer Walter, a dancer at the strip club he worked at as a cook and a bouncer. She struggled with addiction and money issues and had two kids of her own that she did not have custody over. When Christopher saw Jennifer starting to spiral out of control, he took her into his home and made attempts to help her straighten her life out. On one of Christopher's scheduled weekends with his baby in 1999, Christy told her parents she was going out with her new boyfriend that night and not to wait up for her. The next morning, law enforcement showed up at the families and told them that Christy was dead. A deputy found her car and body engulfed in flames. The remains were charred beyond recognition and authorities suspected she was murdered. Christopher seemed shocked and was extremely cooperative. He claimed he was at home with Jennifer that night. When police noticed some suspicious scratches on his chest, the couple claimed it was from getting too rough in the bedroom. During individual questioning, Christopher revealed that Christy planned to pick up their son that night, but never showed up. He showed interrogators his phone log, which listed three calls to the victim. Christy's boyfriend told investigators that he and Christy planned to spend the night together, but that she cut things short after getting into some heated phone calls. Her phone record showed not three, but 12 phone calls between her and Christopher that night. A search of Christopher and Jennifer's apartment revealed a huge blood stain, which matched Christy. At that point, Christopher tried to play innocent. He threw Jennifer under the bus by blaming her for Christy's murder, claiming that she had a problem with Christy still being part of their lives. Outraged that Christopher tried to blame her, Jennifer came clean. She said her lover had developed an obsessive rage over his custody battle with Christy. He started talking about wanting to get rid of his child's mother. At first, Jennifer didn't think he was being serious. She realized she was wrong when Christopher lured Christy to their apartment the night of the murder. Jennifer admitted that she helped Christopher kill his member and get rid of the body. It was soon discovered that the police had pulled the couple over for a traffic violation on their way home from parking Christy's SUV and setting it on fire, proving that Christopher was involved despite his constant claims of innocence. After pointing the finger at one another for months, Jennifer and Christopher both pleaded guilty to murder and were sentenced to 45 and 50 years in prison. Number 3. Brittany Norwood One morning in 2011, the manager of a Lululemon in Bethesda, Maryland, found the store in complete disarray. In a back room, employee Jana Murray was lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood, 
with something around her neck. Brittany Norwood, who had closed the store with Murray the night before, was in a nearby bathroom with her hands and feet tied up with zip ties and blood splattered on her face. She seemed to be semi-conscious and was soon in good enough shape to speak with the police. According to Norwood's version of events, she called Murray on the phone a few minutes after closing the store and said she forgot her wallet inside. The two women met up and went back inside together so she could grab it. While they were there, two men in ski masks entered the store and attacked them. After initially treating Norwood as a victim, police eventually started to doubt her version of events. While Murray was attacked viciously, Norwood's injuries were minor and seemed self-inflicted, and the store appeared to be staged to look ransacked. Forensic experts were able to prove that the crime scene did not match up with Norwood's story. Employees at an Apple store next to the Lululemon told police that they overheard a fight between two women on the night of Murray's murder, pointing toward Norwood lying about what really happened. Unfortunately, the Apple employees wrote the noise off as typical drama and didn't call authorities or pursue the situation any further. Three blocks away from the crime scene, law enforcement located Murray's car. Inside, they found a mixture of her and Norwood's blood. Despite the mounting pile of evidence against her, Norwood stuck to her story, claiming that the men who attacked her and Murray ordered her to move her car. She said they let her go by herself and ordered her to come back in 10 minutes or else they would track her down and kill her. At this point, Norwood's story had become completely unbelievable and there was enough evidence to charge her with first-degree murder. At trial, the court heard how Murray caught Norwood trying to steal some leggings while they were closing up the store. After leaving, Murray called the manager to report the discovery. A few minutes later, Norwood called Murray and, as she had already admitted, said that she left her wallet at work. Prosecutors accused Norwood of luring Murray back to the store and killing her, perhaps thinking it would stop the victim from reporting the theft. She made up the story about the masked intruders, hoping to fool the police and continue her life as usual. She was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Number 2. Brian Cooper At just 21 years old, Alicia Bromfield was a college student with a full-time job and a baby already on the way. Sadly, the child's father wanted no involvement with the baby. Her plate was full, but she embraced all of life's curveballs and looked forward to her future family. In May 2012, she returned to her summer job at a Home Depot store in Northern Illinois. It wasn't long before her supervisor there, 36-year-old Brian Cooper, made unwanted romantic advances towards her. When Alicia rejected him, Cooper started harassing her, at times calling her names and even throwing things at her in front of other employees. He also told multiple people that Alicia was his girlfriend, which was obviously not true, and threatened to cut her hours or fire her if she didn't follow his demands. As a single mother-to-be, it was important for Alicia to keep a steady paycheck coming in, so she hesitated to complain about the abuse at first. But Cooper's behavior eventually became unbearable, so she reported him multiple times to upper management. Sadly, the harassment didn't stop, and Cooper suffered no apparent consequences. In August 2012, he forced Alicia to go to his sister's wedding four hours away in Door County, Wisconsin with him. Knowing how he treated her daughter, Alicia's mom begged her not to go to the event. By then, Alicia was already seven months pregnant, and her loved ones feared not only for her safety, but for the well-being of her unborn child. Sadly, Alicia felt like she had no choice but to attend the wedding. She told her mom she made it clear to Cooper that they were going together as friends. On the morning of the wedding, Alicia contacted her mom again and said she was on her way home. She and Cooper had gotten into a fight after she realized they weren't staying in the same hotel as the wedding party like he promised, which made her feel extremely unsafe. Cooper talked Alicia into staying for the wedding, but she told him she wanted to go straight home the morning after and that they were no longer friends. After returning to their hotel room for the night, Cooper tried making plans with Alicia to watch a movie together the next day. She reminded him that she wanted nothing to do with him, and he flew into an unhinged rage. Cooper strangled Alicia to death. Several hours later, he called 911 using a gas station telephone and reported that he had killed the young woman. He fully admitted that the crime was intentional, but argued at trial that he was too drunk to have acted with intent. During the proceedings, the court heard about how Cooper had been spying on Alicia way more than she knew by filming her in the bathroom at the hotel they were staying at for the wedding. 
The first trial ended with a hung jury. A jury convicted Cooper on all charges during a second trial, including the murder of Alicia and her baby, and he received two life sentences without parole. Number 1. Christopher O'Crowley in 2015, a 24-year-old woman named Caroline Nozel became the assistant produce manager at a grocery store in Madison, Wisconsin. She was known for her bubbly personality, was extremely well-liked among her co-workers, and often went out of her way to make new workers feel welcome to the store. She even befriended Christopher O'Crowley, a meat department employee who was friendly but tended to keep to himself. He gave off strange vibes to some of his co-workers. As Caroline got to know Christopher better, she learned that his life wasn't going that well. He had recently gone through a bad breakup, was homeless for a short period of time, and had a child he didn't get to see. Christopher also didn't have a solid support network. Being the caring person that she was, Caroline offered to be there for her co-worker when he needed her. Other employees were scared that Caroline kind nature would somehow backfire on her. They had a bad feeling about Chris, and rumors soon started to fly about him flirting with a woman who was way too young for him. Even after being branded as a creep, Caroline was willing to give her new friend the benefit of the doubt. A few weeks later, she had too much to drink during an outing with her work friends. When she asked to be taken home, Chris quickly volunteered for the task. But he wasn't sure where Caroline lived, so he took her to his place instead. The next morning, Caroline couldn't shake the suspicion that Chris may have come onto her when she was drunk the night before. She had no romantic interest in him at all, and it began to dawn on her that he may have misinterpreted her soft spot for him as romantic intentions. Realizing her co-workers were right about something being off, she slowly started to distance herself from Chris. At the same time, he began to cling on to Caroline. He texted her non-stop and hung around her constantly while at work. After initially feeling bad for her socially awkward colleague, Caroline felt overwhelmed and unsafe. She stopped responding to the constant barrage of text messages and tried to avoid Chris at work, but he became obsessive. She finally put her foot down and told Chris to stop smothering her, but that failed to make the harassment stop. Soon, he targeted her friends at work. He was fired in early 2016 after Caroline reported him for inappropriate interactions with a younger female co-worker at the store. On top of already being angry that Caroline had stopped talking to him, Chris blamed her for being terminated. Shortly after being fired, he shot Caroline in the chest three times as she left work one night. She died from her injuries, and Chris was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. In 2017, less than a year into his prison sentence, he was discovered dead in his cell. While some might say he managed to escape justice, the most important thing is that he's no longer a danger to society. Would you rather be accused of something you didn't do or be accused of lying to the police? Tell us which you would choose in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.